It's just a science project. Silent breed is people! You know, a doctor friend once said the same thing to me. Frankenstein was his name. It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! That sounds like something out of science fiction. Please explain to me the scientific nature of the whammy. We live in a spaceship, dear. So? Yes, science! Program complete. Enter when ready. Hello and welcome to episode 295 of Science on Top. Today is Thursday the 3rd of May 2018. I'm Ed Brown and joining me today is Penny Dumsday. Hello. And a high school biology teacher with a background in evolutionary biology. Welcome to the show, Sarah DeGarris. Hello. It is great to have you on the show. Finally, as I said before the show, we've been wanting to get you on for some time and it's finally happened. I'm excited to be here. (laughs) And well, you should be because today we'll be talking all about fruit flies and sex and (laughs) horses that remember if you smiled and why your kids are like the Energizer bunny. They just keep going and going and going. But first, you can help us make the show by going to scienceontop.com slash donate and pledging to support us on Patreon. You can choose your level of support to get different rewards. We're really grateful to everyone who chips in and helps us out. Now, Penny, they say never smile at a crocodile, but according to a study by a team from the University of Sussex, you probably should smile at a horse. The study, published in the journal Cell Biology, shows that horses can not only distinguish human facial expressions, but they remember people's emotional states several hours later. This is kind of cool. It is absolutely super cool. Now, I have to say straight up, I'm not a horse person, and some of my more terrifying experiences as a teacher have been sitting on a walking horse at Year 7 camp. (laughs) 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 <laughs> but, um, I feel like there are lots of yeah. stories that I need to ask for a oh, <laughs> off air. No, it's just like it was a horse. It was the most placid horse in the universe. I was sitting on it going, oh, my God, oh, my God, don't show fear, uh. which is probably quite relevant because, yeah, as Ed said, the, um, this recent study has found that horses can remember um, the facial expressions of someone and they respond to them too. Which I'm not surprised because from people I know that do love horses, they seem to form bonds with their horses just like people form bonds with their dogs, you know. It seems to be a real connection between people and horses. And horses are group animals. So they like to give together, not give to, live together. So it's not surprising that they would have the capacity to recognise and remember emotional states, at least of other horses. But what I thought was really interesting is that they do this with people too. They can register an emotion, remember it, and then they use it to sort of guide the way that they behave in future with that person. So they got data from 11 horses and they'd been shown a picture of a human either pulling an angry face and 10 which had a picture of a human smiling. So they were shown one of those photographs for two minutes and then a few hours later they were brought face to face with the person they'd seen in the photo who was told to put on a neutral face. So they saw a photo of someone smiling or being angry and then later they met that person neutral. But the person who was meeting the horse wasn't told if the horse had seen the angry photo or the happy photo and that means that they couldn't give any cues to sort of hint to the horse Mm -hmm. um, what it had been. And so what it found is that the horses, and this is why I really liked this, because I was like, well, how do they know if the horse remembers that someone's angry? So if they had seen an angry picture of the person, they looked, uh, they spent a longer time looking at them with their left eye than the ones who'd seen a happy photo. Like, okay. Sorry, so the horses are like giving you side eye. (laughs) They're giving you side eye. And I guess if you think about a horse, they're, you know, typical herbivores, they've got a long sort of their face but with their eyes on either side of their head. So they have quite a big field of vision. So I guess it's quite obvious which eye a horse is looking at you with. But the left eye is connected to the right hemisphere of the brain, which is where the horse uh, processes potential threats and dangers. So someone, a horse who saw an angry person then associates that person with a potential threat. Whereas if they saw a happy person, 
they spend longer looking at it with the right eye and the right eye connects to the left brain, which in the horse is specialized for sort of social interactions. Okay. So I thought that was interesting. They also found that the horse that saw an angry photo seemed to find the meeting more stressful and they did more behaviors like licking and chewing, scratching and sniffing at the floor. And this apparently was consistent regardless of who was in the picture um, and so on. So I just thought that was quite interesting. Like if, if it is what they're doing, if a horse can remember a facial expression of a specific person and remember that hours later, hmm. it's, it's quite interesting. You, it, you, it does make you wonder if it's, if it's just sort of a byproduct of something that they do with other horses um, or if it's to do with them being domesticated and living so closely with yes. humans and bonding, I guess, with specific humans. Yeah, I, I think it, it probably a lot of it is that sort of pattern recognition behavior mm. where they've seen happy and angry humans before yeah. and they sort of learn to be wary of those who are angry all the time. Uh, it would be interesting if you could somehow do this experiment with wild horses who don't have much human interactions. Mm. But... Mm. Um, how you would, I don't know. I have no uh, idea. I wonder if they can pick up just terrified expressions <laughs> as well. <laughs> it's just very interesting because we tend to think of facial recognition as such a human trait mm. that's evolved because we're such relational creatures and a human face and a horse face are quite different and the fact that they can pick that up is really quite amazing because I know in the human brain we have so much of it devoted just to recognizing faces so does that mean the horse brain is better able to do that than we realized if it can detect that or is it only getting sort of a little bit of the facial expression but it's enough for it to realize but it's quite incredible that you know, a non-human animal or not even a primate could recognize mm. facial expressions. Yeah. Well, I'm surprised that they can even recognize expressions amongst other horses. I mean, a horse is not yeah. a particularly expressive facial structure. It doesn't have as many creases and things. Uh, obviously, it does a lot with the lips and the mouth and that. But I'm still impressed by that, let alone that it can read human faces. Yeah. And um, we were talking about doing a study with wild horses and that. Um this is, they describe this as a small study, but I think mm, 24 yeah. horses is still a lot for I a think horse study. Quite, I, I mean, think there's <laughs> quite a lot of horses actually to be in one spot, yeah. like just personally. <laughs> I don't even know if they were in the one spot. Maybe they were at several different uh, places. I mean, horses, I don't know if anyone knows, are actually quite large animals. <laughs> <laughs> Some big scary animals. <laughs> but uh, impressive. And I'm sure this is not a surprise to people who work with horses all the time. Oh, no. I'm sure this is yeah. just confirmation of what they've already known, but now it's actually scientifically documented, which mm -hmm. is always cool. All right. Well, let's move on. And from what I understand, a lot of people find sex to be an enjoyable activity. But a study led by a neuroscientist at Bar Ilan University finds that fruit flies also seem to enjoy getting it on, or at least the males do, right, Sarah? Yeah, that's right. Um, I was very interested in this study because I myself, um, during my master's, researched fruit flies, but unfortunately for the fruit flies, my study was not nearly so nice for them uh, because I basically desiccated them to death wow. multiple <laughs> times to try and select these super desiccation resistant line of flies. So I killed countless like thousands upon thousands of flies in awful ways you yet in this study I, I know <laughs> I feel really bad in this study the flies just get to go under some red light and ejaculate lots and that seems much more pleasant for them so I feel like maybe I did the wrong thing and these guys are being much more kind to the flies you should have um, thought about studying fly ejaculation I should have I should have suggested that um, yeah but yeah this study was very interesting um because looking at the idea of pleasure in sex in, in insects is, is quite amazing. So these seemingly very simple creatures, but there's evidence that they actually find, or well, the males find sex to be pleasurable. So it was already known that the whole act of mating, so including all the courtship and the actual act of copulation coming to its conclusion, was pleasurable for 
the flies, but they weren't sure exactly what part of that process was the bit that was pleasurable. Okay, and by can pleasurable, I just stop you there? Yeah, sure. How do we know that they're enjoying that bit, like any of it? Is there a smile on their face or something? Like- <laughs> yeah, look, it, look, it, it's like, look it's like with horses. <laughs> if you're a fly person like I am, you can read their emotions, those little creatures, <laughs> okay. like ho- horror that they're getting killed. But, no, it, it's really about the act of, um, activating the, the neural reward pathways that releases uh, a certain protein factor that they can recognize. Um, So they can detect levels of this neurotransmitter chemical that's released that is associated with um, a reward pathway. So that's how they can tell that the fly is actually happy or enjoying this. And this is the same chemical is actually released when the flies have alcohol. So that's also a rewarding Mm -hmm. experience for them. so, you know, maybe we have more in common with flies than we like to think. Um, well, one of our first stories that we did on this show was about fruit flies. When males get rejected by the females, they are more likely to go and drink from alcoholic uh, fermented uh, fruit. Yeah. <laughs> so they drown their sorrows. That, it, it's exactly right. And, and to be fair to the flies... They are meant to have alcohol. It is part of their diet. They do eat fermenting fruit, but they hit it a little harder if they haven't been getting any action, the poor flies. But interestingly, in this study, they found that the flies um, were less likely to have alcohol um, when they were able to ejaculate. So what they found, how they how they worked this out, how they how they needed to separate the flies copulating with a female. Uh, and ejaculation to work out, well, what is it that actually activates these reward pathways? Is it something about the mating ritual or being with the female or is it the actual ejaculation? So they needed to somehow get a whole bunch of male fruit flies to ejaculate without there being any female flies around. And they had quite an ingenious way of doing this where they (laughs) used red light and the red light stimulated the release of the chemical that caused ejaculation. So they genetically engineered the flies um, to respond to that red pigment to cause the ejaculation to happen. And then what they could do is they could measure how the flies responded to red light. So if they were enjoying the ejaculation, you'd think that they would seek out the red light so that they could keep on ejaculating. Whereas if there was no effect, you think it would be random whether they chose the red light area of the little box that they had or the bit that had no light. And sure enough, they found that the flies kept going back and back to that red light so that they could keep on ejaculating. So they're saying, well, this this means they're clearly enjoying this because they're seeking it out and seeking it out. Um, And then, yes, these same flies then were less likely to need to consume more alcohol after they've had all that ejaculation because they had enough of their reward pathway being stimulated through that so they didn't need to turn to the ethanol. So it was just a very happy story for the flies. Like, <laughs> what? It's just such a nice change. Um, and and it, it's just very interesting to see that, well, actually there is an evolutionary benefit for sex to be pleasurable, at least for the male flies. And so interestingly in some other species, um, it's been shown in non-human animals that, you know, females can also get pleasure from sex, but who knows for the fruit flies. So there's another study, which is going to be much trickier. I think that would be a very <laughs> clever thing to design an experiment that could test that. But yeah. we'll see. I, 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 I'm, I can't believe I'm asking this question, but like do female fruit flies even orgasm? Uh, I, I, this is a completely yep. different world to who, me. <laughs> that, that, you know... It's like I have some skills. I can tell whether flies are virgin or not, but I can't tell whether they've orgasm. That is beyond me. There is so, so. much to unpack in this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> okay, look, I'm going there. How do you know if a fruit flies are virgin? Uh, well, they have something called a virgin spot. 
but it, it and and when you can see them, they're young. They've got this virgin spot, which is actually sort of this bit of green pooish stuff inside them that then comes out. But it's it's not really proof that they're a virgin. It's just proof really that they're too young to mate yet. Okay. So Immature. you know you could get away with being a sort of mature age female fly, and you couldn't really tell if they're a virgin or not. But if they do have this spot, you know that they must be virgins, and you can separate them, which is what they have to do in a lot of studies to ensure that you've got these unmated flies. So you have to collect them to make sure they're still virgins. So I spent many hours of my life doing that that I will not get back. <laughs> <laughs> no regrets. <laughs> yeah, no. And the other thing that you said that really blew my mind was they genetically engineered these fruit flies to ejaculate when they get red, when they're shown red light. Like this is where genetic engineering is going, where we can edit animals to orgasm by shining a light at them. This is crazy Absolutely. and some weird sci-fi dystopia. I'm not happy with this. <laughs> You can also make things glow. I mean, you know. Well, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so you can, but this is actually a very useful thing. Um, yeah, it, it's, it's just incredible because linking two genes up together and it's like a switch and then the light is, is caused the switch to switch on and make um, – the protein that causes the fly to ejaculate. So it, it's incredible. It is as simple really as, as a switch and you can just make something happen um, through linking these two genes together. So it's incredible. I'm just running all these scenarios through my head. Like what if some escape from the lab or whatever and then they're out in the population and then we get this whole epidemic of fruit flies that ejaculate all the time whenever there's red light around I, is... I should check because i get lots over my green waste bin so i should start <laughs> flashing <laughs> a red light down red there light. just to see what happened because you know what else am i going to do on a saturday night I, I think we need to start this as a citizen science project i think all our listeners need to get out with a red torch or red cellophane over a torch and just shine it on some fruit flies and and tell us right in let us know what happens it gives us a whole new meaning to a red light district. Yes. Boom. <laughs> <laughs> I've been here all week. Oh, fantastic. All right. Uh, Penny, let's let's go somewhere a little bit more bizarre and talk about fungus. And a fungus that has repurposed a gene from bacteria and, and it senses gravity and somehow crystals are involved. I do not understand what's happening here. I think this is quite cool. So this is a kind of pin mould, um, Phycomyces blakeslianus. And what this fungus does is it grows in dung and it needs to know which way is up so it can send out its fruiting body with spores on the top and reproduce. Now, lots and lots of um, organisms need to know which way is up and they do it in different ways. So, for example, you probably noticed that plants grow with their leaves growing up towards the light and their roots grow down into the ground. They need to be able to sense gravity somehow and so does this fungus. And the trick, the way that this fungus does it is it, um, it grows large protein crystals that fall into the bottom of special compartments in its cells. As they fall to the bottom, that lets the organism know well, where the proteins are, then that's down and when they're not, that's up. And so that could control the way that it grows. So great, it makes this protein. Um, the protein falls down, fungus knows which way is up and down. Wonderful. However, what is really interesting is that the gene for this protein actually originated in a bacteria. So it's a really strange case of horizontal gene transfer or when DNA gets exchanged between different organisms. So in this case, a bacterium and a fungus. So usually it's um, something that's really useful straight off, like antibiotic resistance, and that gets swapped between different bacteria. Mm -hmm. But this one is interesting because bacteria don't, or it has not been found yet any bacteria that has this gravitropic function. So this gene isn't making crystals in bacteria that fall down. It's doing something else. So what I thought was really interesting is that this fungus has got this gene somehow from a bacterium. Um, there's no sort of use for it, which is fair enough, 
But then, because I think one of the things when we think about evolution, we always think, oh, it needs to sense gravity, therefore it's going to evolve a gravity sensing gene. Well, that's <laughs> yeah. not really how evolution works. So it, this horizontal gene transfer has happened. But what I think is interesting is it's using a gene that was obviously doing something else in a bacterium as a gravitropic gene. So no one really knows what it does in the bacteria or why it gave an advantage first off to the fungus who got it. But it's happened and, yeah, I just find this really, really weird it's, and it's quite weird. interesting. Not only, like we've talked about uh, horizontal gene transfer before, we've talked about mm. uh, retrotransposons where gene as genes can be passed through different species and things but this is different kingdoms altogether different kingdoms and then using it for a completely different purpose yeah which i mean i guess in some ways nothing surprises me really <laughs> you know but um yeah yeah i and did like all the kind of weirdness in this yeah and for all i know i mean that cross kingdom transfer happens all the time. Maybe if Shane was on here, he'd tell me that I'm, yeah. I'm surprised for no reason. This is a common place uh, thing, but I, I've never heard of it happening before. So I think it's very cool. All right. Uh, well, I'm sure all parents have noticed that kids seem to have incredibly high levels of energy and they can keep running around until, well, sometimes they just suddenly conk out and fall asleep, which is hilarious. So it probably won't surprise many people to hear that a new study comparing children and adults in strenuous cycling finds that kids are not only better than most adults, they can be better than highly trained adult endurance athletes. Now, Sarah, we're not saying they're faster than athletes, but we're talking about things like recovery and stamina, aren't we? Yes, that's right. Um, so in this study, they looked at kids who are about 10 years old and they compared them to normal type adults who did a similar amount of physical activity to those kids. So it wasn't comparing, you know, the average kid who runs around to some couch potato adults who I won't name, but they were comparing them to, you know, adults who did about the same level of activity as the kids. And then they also compared them to elite endurance athletes. So, so um people who were at the top of their field who could exercise for long periods of time uh, and fatigue less quickly than regular adults. And they found that the children were really far superior to the regular adults and more similar in a lot of characteristics to the uh, elite endurance athletes. So they, their fatigue was lower. They were able to keep going longer during this at intense uh, cycling activity than the regular adults. And what they found is that the reason that children were able to uh, fatigue less quickly is they actually spent um, more of <clears throat> more of their time undergoing aerobic respiration rather than anaerobic respiration. So the difference between that those two things is aer aerobic respiration is when you use oxygen to gain the energy that you need to do everything in your body, all the functions in your cells. Just being alive, you need to use huge amounts of energy that you gain from the food that you eat. So in this chemical reaction of cellular respiration, it begins with glucose um, that you've obtained from your food uh, and in aerobic respiration you convert that glucose into a more usable form for your body called ATP and you need oxygen to do that but in a situation where oxygen is in short supply so for instance when you're doing really intense exercise like intense cycling is you start running out of that oxygen in your muscles. So you need to go through a different pathway called anaerobic respiration where oxygen isn't needed. And that gets you less ATP, so less energy at the end of it, but also it produces byproducts like lactic acid, which gives you that sort of horrible feeling that you have, that burning feeling in your muscles, and that causes fatigue. So for most of us, once we do these intense activities, you spend um, – 
more of the metabolism or the respiration is anaerobic, whereas for elite endurance athletes, they can spend more time doing aerobic respiration, which means they can get more energy out of it, keep going for longer and be less fatigued. And it seems like children are like elite athletes. They spend more time in this aerobic form of respiration um, rather than the anaerobic form. And then it, that changes once they hit adolescence and become adults. So the adults they used in this study were about 21 years old. So they're, you would think at sort of the peak of their physical conditioning, they weren't testing it on middle-aged people. They were still young, but they were not uh, as young as the children. So it had to be prepubescent children. You know, once you hit puberty, it seems like it's, you know, on that downhill path to being an adult who is going to start tiring out quite easily. But yes, yeah, so I thought this was very interesting just because I can see my own kids and sometimes, you know, I, I've heard people say to me, oh, if only I could have some of their energy and I feel the same way and they just keep going and going. So I feel better about it now that there is a reason. It's not just that I'm really lazy or can't be bothered, which is also partially true, but it's not my fault. It's you know, their <laughs> muscles are different. You know, it's biochemical. Like I can't do anything about it. I can't go back in time. So they've just got an advantage. It's really not fair. I can't compete and I shouldn't try. <laughs> No, I also feel like that whole experiment sounds like some badly thought out reality TV show. Like, are you fitter <laughs> than a 10 year old or something? Absolutely. Well, it'd be, it's like those precocious kid shows where like the kids oh. are better than the adults. Yeah. And they could just do a big obstacle course and just watch the kids win. Although, I mean, the article did point out that, that kids, obviously, their muscles aren't as skillful. So, that they they have a lot of things that they're not as good at as the adults. Um, but it's just this ability to keep on going and keep on going like the energi Energizer Bunny, like yeah. you said, <laughs> because the aerobic pathway just enables you to recover more quickly and get more, you know, use that oxygen more effectively and be less uh, tired and n less time for recovery. I think we'd all like that time machine to be able to go and have the, some of those <laughs> <laughs> attributes still. And I think that's our show. As always, you can find the links in the show notes at scienceontop.com slash 295. And you can always help us out by going to scienceontop.com slash donate and pledging to support us on Patreon. But perhaps the best way you can support the show is by telling your friends about us and posting on social media, getting the word out. Thanks a lot for joining me today, Sarah and Penny. Thanks, Ed. Thank you. And thank you, everyone, for listening. We'll be back again next week, putting science on top of the agenda. Do you understand? Now, take the alternative scenario where you move out into the solar system. The solar system can easily support a trillion humans. And if we had a trillion humans, we would have a thousand Einsteins and a thousand Mozarts and unlimited, for all practical purposes, resources from solar power and so on. Why not? That's, I, that's the world that I want my great-grandchildren's great-grandchildren to live in. And by the way, I believe that we will move all heavy, in that time frame, we will move all heavy industry off of Earth, and Earth will be zoned residential and light industry. And it will basically be a very beautiful planet. We have sent robotic probes to every planet in this solar system now. And believe me, this is the best one. But when can it I is not even close. <laughs>